Hello everyone, this is Cobain the Christian, and this is part two of uh, my uh, commentary, kind of, on Genesis chapter one. Uh, we ended last time on the fourth day. We saw that on the fourth day, God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they are described in terms of ruling over the world. They're a symbol of God's sovereignty over the world. And because they're a symbol of God's sovereignty over the world, they do the kinds of things that God does. They distinguish between light and darkness, as God did in Genesis chapter 1. And we saw that this is the terms in which God speaks of man, which is why man is supposed to shine like the stars of heavens, as the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Philippians. And it's why the angels who are on the divine council in the Old Testament uh, are described as stars, especially in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, so now that we've, we've gone through those, let's just work through days 5, 6, and 7. Day 5. God said, uh, let the waters swarm with living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea dragons and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. Now this is a day which uh, it can be difficult to see its significance in the rest of biblical theology. Because when you work through other creation week patterns, it's often very easy to see how the fourth slot of that pattern fits with the fourth day. That's how you usually know there is a creation week pattern because it very clearly mentions one of the heavenly bodies. Uh, but the fifth day often seems kind of random. Uh, but when you work through these creation week patterns, what you find is there is a consistent pattern. It often refers to clothes or incense. Why is that? Well, it's because on the fifth day, this is where you see clouds of things. There are swarms of living creatures. Birds fly in flocks. Fish swim in schools. God created birds and fish on the same day, and actually there is a deep correspondence between what birds do and what fish do. Birds fly across the air, and fish, as it were, fly through the sea. They can move uh, in all three dimensions, unlike us, who are limited to the ground. And they fly and they swim in flocks and schools. Uh, one of the interesting things is, is that there seems to be an irreducible structure to flocks and to schools of fish. In other words, when experiments have been done looking at the nature and speed of their movement, it does not seem as if one bird sees the other bird moving and then that rapidly spreads through the whole flock. It seems as if they really do move as one. It seems that this is structured as an actual field. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake, who I know some people think are kooky, but I've really enjoyed his stuff, uh, has spoken a fair bit about this, and I think it's very interesting. Uh, what this corresponds to in uh, the creation is God's glory cloud. And whenever you see the glory cloud of God, and you go inside it, what you find is there's the angel of the Lord in the center, and then there are thousands upon thousands of angels buzzing around him. And they aren't buzzing around him randomly, you find that they're divided into ranks. They have a definite structure and order to their swirling around God. So Deuteronomy 33 says that when God came to Sinai, when his glory descended on Sinai, uh, ten, tens of thousands of his holy ones came with him, which is why Paul says that the Torah was delivered through angels, which many other Jewish documents uh, from the first century say as well. So these are symbols of God's glory cloud. Understanding that birds are symbols of God's angels in the structure of the glory cloud actually draws our attention to other elements of biblical symbolism. One important element of that is that unclean birds, which you see in Leviticus 11, and there's also an allusion to the uncleanness of the raven in uh, Genesis chapter 8, which we'll talk about in my next video on the flood. Uh, unclean birds symbolize uh, demons. Uh, Revelation 18 makes that very clear because it says that God trapped every unclean spirit and every unclean bird in daughter Babylon, in the city which he was going to destroy. There is a correspondence between these two things. 
Moreover, it helps us understand the nature of the curse of the covenant. Uh, Deuteronomy says that the curse of the covenant is to be divided in two, to be killed, and then to be hung up on a tree for the birds to consume. The blessing of the covenant, as with Adam and as with Abraham in Genesis 15, is to be divided in two and then to be reunited in glorified form. As we've mentioned many times, Genesis 2, God cuts Adam in two. He takes one side of him and he makes that side into a woman and then he brings them back together and they are united so that they both are glorified. And Adam is something more than he was before he was divided in two. Genesis 15, Abraham divides all these animals up. Then he goes into a deep deep sleep, the first time that word has been used since Genesis 2, and in that sleep he sees a vision of the glory of God passing between those sides of the animals. God is reuniting those animals, and it's a sign that God is stitching everything back together through the Abrahamic covenant, which is what Jesus the Messiah ultimately do, does according to uh, Ephesians 1. But the curse of the covenant is to be divided in two and not to be united back together, but rather to be consumed by unclean birds. And what this is a sign of is actually of something that God says in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent is said to be cursed to eat dust. Now, a couple things about this passage. First, this is prophetic. This is not describing the removal of legs from a snake or whatever. The word here for serpent is nachash, which means bright one, if you translate it as an adjective, just like seraph means burning one, if you translate it as an adjective. But in terms of the noun, both seraph and nachash mean the same thing. They mean serpent. So there is a connection between the serpent of Genesis 3 and the angelic host, which is one reason we know that this is Satan. Uh, but this is a prophecy because Satan is, of course, on the divine council through the Old Testament. You see that in Job chapter 1. Uh, and he's only cast out of the divine council. He's dethroned, as it were, from being the God of that age uh, when Jesus ascends into heaven and defeats him, which is what we see in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, this is uh, when God says that he's going to be e eating dust. What this means is that he's going to be placed under the earth. And symbolically speaking, being placed under the earth is to be placed in Sheol. We see that in Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah 14, we have the king of Babylon, and it's not a specific historical king. Rather, Babylon here is a symbol of all of the evil in the world. And the way we know that is because we have the city of man being founded by Cain and his son in Genesis chapter 4, and that city in the literary structure of Genesis chapters 1 to 11 is refounded after the flood, and it is called Babylon, word Babel and Babylon, they're exactly the same word. And from that point onwards, Babylon in the Bible takes on the symbolic weight of being the wicked city of man. And the king of that prototypical wicked city is Satan. So in Isaiah 14, what do we hear about the king of Babylon? We see that he is shining like the morning star. He uh, shines like the dawn, he's the son of the dawn, just like the dragon in Job, uh, uh, Job 41. The dragon Leviathan is said to have eyes like the dawn. And what happens to the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14? Well, first he's above the stars of heaven, that's the language used for the divine council. Then he's taken and he's placed under the earth. The kings of the, of the nations meet him as he's placed in Sheol, as he's placed in death. Uh, uh, and remember, death means to be eternally torn in two. Your will and your nature are eternally divided because the nature of both man and any of the angelic hosts is good, but their will is eternally opposed to it, and that is their eternal condemnation because death in the Bible means division, and they are eternally divided. So Satan is placed in Sheol. He's placed under the earth, fulfilling the prophecy that the serpent is going to eat the dust. But what else we do, do we know about dust? We know that man was made from dust and he's going to return to dust when he dies. And so when we hear that the serpent is going to eat dust, what we're being told is that the serpent eats dead men. Now, hell is simply the eternal actualization of death. That's why it's called the second death. It's eternal division. So Sheol is a type of hell. And in fact, hell is the eternal form of Sheol. And so when the serpent is said to eat dust, he eats dead men. He eats those men who have been condemned to hell, which is why we hear that 
uh, the wicked are cast into a hell which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Just as we inherit the world because we are in Christ, so the wicked inherit hell because they are in the devil. And the reason I went into that is because this is the basis for the symbolic nature of the curse of the covenant. The birds, the unclean birds, which symbolize unclean spirits, consume the person who has been divided and uh, not reunited again. And so that is one of the things that we learn from looking at the fifth day and looking at the nature of the symbolism here. Chiastically, uh, Genesis chapter 1 is a chiasm. Uh, day 1 corresponds to day 7, 2 corresponds to day 6, and 3 to uh, day 5, and then the fourth day is a central day. Um, chiastically, this matches the separation of the land from the sea, because the birds, while they fly across the expanse of the heavens, we are told that they actually dwell in the trees. They dwell, uh, they dwell on the land. Sorry, just had a problem with recording there. Uh, and the proof that they draw on the land is looking at uh, verse 22, which says that the let birds multiply on the earth. So birds are the creation corresponding to the land. It's a glory cloud for the land. And fish are a glory cloud for the sea. So a symbol of God's glory both on land and on uh, sea. And birds dwell in trees from which they sing. This corresponds to, I mean, trees in the Bible are symbols of God's glory cloud. That's why the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a celebration of the glory of God coming to dwell with man, Feast of Tabernacles, Israelites wear trees. They are in a tree house, uh, and that symbolizes their incorporation into the divine glory. So that birds are singing in trees matches the angelic hosts, who, of course, are a host of singers in the cloud of, in the cloud of God. And it's why when the glory comes down to consume the sacrifices in the temple, Chronicles tells us that the Levitical orchestra was singing at that point. So there's a correspondence between the song of birds and the uh, uh, song in the glory cloud. I mean, there's all sorts of symbolic associations which birds have in the creation. They sing when? In the morning, because they sing when the world is raised from the dead each day. Uh, and looking at the creation symbolically, as James Jordan would say, we look at it through new eyes, and it's beautiful in all sorts of new ways. God blessed them. This is the first time that God pronounces a blessing on the world, and these are the first living creatures. Uh, life in the Bible means that you have blood, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. So in terms of the biblical definition of life, this is the first life, because birds and fish uh, have blood. And this is the first blessing that God pronounces, which is going to climax in the blessing of man and then the sabbatical blessing on uh, day seven. They're told to be fruitful and multiply. Now, if we just read that in context, that refers back to day three, because on day three, we have fruit trees, fruit bearing fruit. And so the multiplication of creatures uh, symbolize, or is symbolized by the growing of new plants and the multiplication of trees on the third day, which is why trees correspond to people in the Bible. And the growth of forests is a sign that God is going to multiply Israel. That's what it says in Isaiah 40 to 55, that God is going to make the fruitful field a forest, just like he is going to give Abraham a whole host of new descendants in Isaiah 54 to 55. This is really the basis of that kind of symbolism. Uh, if we look at Genesis as a whole, one way that it's structured is each set, each, these are the generations of, corresponds to a day of creation. And there are a couple of those where it's like 3A and 3B and 6A and 6B, which is why um, it ultimately comes to seven, even though there are 10 sets of these are the generations of. But if you look at the, uh, the third set, it corresponds to Genesis 10, where we see 70 nations, and thus, when Israel comes up out of Egypt in, in Exodus chapter 15, they see a forest of 70 trees, and there are 12 springs. 12 springs symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel who bless the 70 nations of the world. So it's important to remember all this stuff because the symbolism carries forward. And obviously Psalm 1 is a classic passage. Uh, the righteous are like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit in, that season, in, in its season. And Ezekiel 7 picks that up and says that when the river of life flows out of the temple, there will be... Uh, trees which bear their fruit in season. Revelation says their leaves are for the healing of the nations. Those are talking about uh, blessed 
people. So lots of cool stuff here. Uh, and then we have the, oh, and I, I really should mention this, of course. Uh, I don't know, I, I think I've said this already, but the reason that the fifth day in creation week patterns is incense and clothes is because clothes symbolize the glory of God. Adam and Eve were naked, but they weren't meant to be naked eternally. They were meant to be exalted and clothed in God's glory, which is what the saints wear in the book of Revelation. The saints are clothed in the glory of God. And incense is a symbol of the glory cloud. When the high priest on the day of atonement ascends on a cloud of incense, it is a sign of Jesus, the Messiah, uh, ascending on the glory cloud. That's why Daniel, Daniel 7, which recapitulates the day of atonement, has the son of man, who is the high priest, the high priest is a new Adam, and he's the son of Adam, the son of Adam ascends on the clouds of heaven. See, every detail in the Bible is given for a reason. Nothing is random. Nothing is just mere literary artistry. It's all there for a theological purpose. And in that theological purpose, the Bible reveals to us the beauty of God. Um, and moreover, this concept of swarms and hosts uh, these are uh, symbols of God's armies. You can find that in uh, after the period from the return from exile, after Israel doesn't have a physical army anymore. This is where God starts getting called more frequently the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies. Because even though Israel doesn't have a national army anymore, they're called to trust in their God, who is indeed the Lord of armies, and will fight on their behalf. Angels are described, uh, organized very specifically, as I've discussed, and that is because the military is organized in that kind of way. Military is mustered in the book, uh, beginning of the Book of Numbers and in the beginning of Ezra, uh, and they're described as five in their rank, because military is the means by which the king rules, and the number of dominion is five, as I mentioned in my last video. So lots of cool stuff there. Just remember this as you read through the rest of the Bible, because it popped up over and over again. Um, then we have the sixth day. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So this is the first part of the sixth day. Animal, the land animals are made on the same day as man because they have a special relationship with one another. As man gains dominion, he comes to subdue the animals. And the biblical term for an animal that is under man's rule is cattle. So that's true whatever animal is under man's rule. And then there are wild animals, which man has not subdued yet, even though he is called to subdue them. Then we have verse 26, obviously one of the most important passages in the whole Bible. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to unpack. First, what does it mean for man to be created in the image of God? One thing we always have to do is we have to read even the most familiar biblical passages in context. So imagine that you had never read anything in the Bible apart from Genesis 1, and suddenly it says, let us make man in our image. What you would do is you would read that in light of the context. Uh, God has been doing things throughout Genesis 1, and when it says, let us make man in our image, Man is called to do the same kinds of things that God has been doing throughout Genesis 1. So man separates, he distinguishes light from darkness, he gives names to things, he creatively reworks the world, he takes the raw material and he transfigures it. He takes the raw metals that are in the land and he transfigures them into buildings and a glorious city for God. Uh, we see that God says, let us make man in our image. Now, if we look through the rest of the Bible, particularly in Isaiah 6, when God says, let us, this refers to him addressing his heavenly council. As we've mentioned, the heavenly council is the swirling cloud of angels around God, and man is exalted to the heavenly council 
uh, in the new covenant for a little while lowered in the angels, but ultimately crowned with glory and honor, which is why the angels in Revelation 4 to 5 cast down their crowns. Revelation 20, man picks up those crowns which had been cast down by the angels. Man is exalted over the angels. If you look at the Orthodox icon of the communion of saints, this is exactly the structure of the glory cloud that you see in the Bible. You see all the saints and angels in a circle around Christ, and Christ is the angel and Yahweh is enthroned in the center. But is this about the Trinity? Well, yes, it is. It is absolutely about the Trinity. Uh, the reason that the angels are here, because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When God created the heavens, this was his creation of the angelic hosts. So when he addresses his council, we know that the angelic hosts are there. But the only reason there is such a thing as a divine council, a communion of persons in God's divine glory, is because there is an eternal communion of persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we look at language that is used at the Divine Council, very often we see this play between the names God and Lord. God El, El Elyon, or El Shaddai, God Almighty, and uh, the Lord, or Yahweh. Now, this, it does not apply as an absolute rule, but you will find pretty clearly as you work through the scriptures that El, God, or Elohim, or El Shaddai, refers to God as he is Father, and as he is life giver to the world. So God is the father of Israel. Whereas Yahweh or Lord tends to refer to God as he is the bridegroom of Israel. It refers to God in his covenantal relationship with Israel. You find that in Genesis 9, where uh, uh, Yahweh is blessed by God, but Shem is blessed by Yahweh, because Shem is the priestly line whom God is going to have a special covenant with. And as you get to the New Testament, you find the same duality. God tends to refer to the Father, and Lord refers to Jesus the Messiah. So the duality between God and Lord is the duality between Father and Son. Deuteronomy 32, 8-9, God divided the nations, and Yahweh takes Jacob as his allotted portion. This does not mean, as liberal scholars would have it, that Yahweh was just some minor patron god on a divine council, uh, what it means is that Yahweh is the heir of the special nation, Israel. Because when he divided the nations, there were only 70 nations, corresponding to the symbolic number 70 for the divine council. But the inheritance of Christ is the family of Abraham, which is why Romans 4, it is uh, the family of Abraham who inherit the world together with Jesus the Messiah. There is all sorts of stuff in the Bible about this, and it has to do with the divine counsel. And my reason for saying all of this is to make absolutely clear that the divine counsel in the Bible is always related to the Trinity. The Spirit is the one who creates the cloud around God. Spirit is the matchmaker, the uniter of persons. The uh, uh, Father is the head of the council, and the Son, or Yahweh, rules on his behalf. So the Trinity is definitely present in Genesis 1.26, as is the divine council. There shouldn't be an opposition here. Why do we have this address, uh, this plural address? We have not had that uh, before in Genesis 1. Well, the reason is because this is where God creates a fundamental duality in the world. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. This duality between men and women is a sign of the unity of the Trinity because the divine persons are united. They are one in nature, but they are united in their distinction. The Father is always the Father. The Son is always the Son. The Spirit is always the Spirit. They aren't collapsed into each other, but they are united in the midst of that distinction. And the human family is a symbol of the Trinitarian family, of the divine family. The human family is to be one in nature, as the Council of Chalcedon says, but one in nature in and through the great multiplicity of nations. And male and female is the preeminent symbol of this. Male and female is a symbol of the unity between father and son. 1 Corinthians 11 states this. Uh, man is the head of woman, as God is the head of Christ. And so the male-female dyad is the special symbol of God's Trinitarian life, which is why we have this plural address 
for the first time in Genesis chapter 1. Let us create man in his own image. And by the way, this is the ultimate biblical root of why same-sex marriage is impossible. God doesn't forbid same-sex marriages, but marriage as an ontological thing is the unity between a man and a woman. Uh, so we see here, let us make men in our image after our likeness. Now the fathers of the church talk about the distinction between image and likeness. Uh, the image is what we all have by nature. The likeness is what we are to attain when we are glorified. And indeed, this theology is all over the book of Genesis and in Genesis 1 to 3. As I've said many times, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a tree of kingship. It's a tree of exaltation. The glory of God is the means by which Christ rules the world, according to Philippians 3. So this is a tree of deification, as the fathers taught, precisely because it is a tree of exaltation uh, to kingship. Man is created good, but he is supposed to mature and grow into a spiritual adult. And that is the theological root of the distinction between image and likeness. Another way that we can note uh, the root of this patristic teaching in scripture is by noting the next time that we see this plural address in the Bible. The next time God uses this plural is in Genesis 3.22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us in knowing good and evil. This is an address to his heavenly council. What Adam had tried to do was to seize the throne on the heavenly council. And knowledge of good and evil refers to kingship. It is a royal uh, prerogative to make judgments and distinctions. So that is divine council language. But in Genesis chapter 1, man is created in the image of God to attain his likeness. And in Genesis 3.22, man has attempted to seize the likeness of God. The likeness of God is to become an heir of God's household because the heir rules on his behalf. Another piece of evidence for this comes from Genesis 5. Uh, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image. And so the order of the terms is reversed here. Here, likeness comes first. Why? Because while Adam had many other sons, Seth is specifically noted to be in the likeness of Adam because Seth is the heir of the household. Uh, and that is why we have the genealogy that we do in Genesis chapter 5. These are the sons who inherit the prerogatives that Adam had originally been given in Genesis chapter 1. So there is a biblical root to the patristic teaching that uh, there is a distinction between the image and likeness of God. It is in this context that God says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, and all... Uh, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Note that God does not say, I am giving you dominion now, but let them have dominion. This exaltation to rule over the whole earth is something that man is supposed to grow up into. He is supposed to attain it. And we can see that in the language that Genesis 1 uses after this. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And that word subdue is the same word used in Joshua for conquer. So it, it, conquer the world and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God says, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. This is one of the ways that we know that Adam was eventually supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had given them all the trees, but he had told Adam to wait for this one particular tree. Understanding the chronology here sheds additional light on Genesis chapter 3, because here God is addressing man and woman together. But when God gives the commandment to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he had not yet created Eve. And what that means is that all that Eve had heard directly from the mouth of God is that they would have every tree for food. The way that she knew about the commandment to abstain from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because Adam had told her. Thus, when Adam and Eve stood together at the tree of knowledge and the serpent told her to eat uh, the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and Adam didn't say anything. Genesis 3, 6, Adam was with her. 
she became confused, and that is why the scripture says Eve was deceived. Eve was tricked, which is why this her sin was less serious than Adam's. Adam committed a high-handed revolt against God, to use Levitical terminology. Adam knew exactly what he was doing when he didn't speak up and defend his bride against the serpent. So that is one thing that we get by understanding the way that Genesis 1 relates to Genesis 2. Um, let's see. Uh, as I mentioned, fill the earth and subdue it or conquer it. This is language used for conquest. Uh, in the large story of the Bible, we can see a parallel to this. Adam and Eve were created. They were meant to eventually inherit the whole earth. But before they were to inherit the whole earth, they would occupy a garden. And that was the land that they were given at that particular moment in time. Well, when the world is renewed, what happens? God calls the family of Abraham as a corporate Adam. He gives them the land of Israel as at their Garden of Eden. But eventually, they are supposed to inherit the whole earth, which is what happens in the New Covenant when Jesus the Messiah comes and the family of Abraham goes forth and inherits the entire creation and all nations in the world, not just the one strip of land in the land of Israel. And that distinction is made in the scripture itself. Isaiah 66 uh, alludes to Numbers 14, Isaiah 65, 66. And where Isaiah 65 says, new heavens and new earth, Numbers 14 speaks of the land of Israel. So the, the idea that the whole creation was supposed to be the new promised land for the renewed Israel is not just there in the New Testament, it is there in the Old Testament as well. We see here that God gives Adam the sacramental plants that have been created in Genesis chapter 3, or I'm sorry, in the third day of creation. So this is, a, this is all in terms of a liturgical context. Uh, and this illuminates another way in which we can understand the image of God. To be the image of God is like the images that were placed in ancient temples. Uh, this is the ultimate historical and theological root of people placing images of the gods in the Holy of Holies. They weren't supposed to do that, but the root of that was that God had created man as image, his image, and the whole creation was the temple, which is why the language of sacramental plants is used because it all takes place in a liturgical context. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Genesis 2 begins, this is part of the same narrative as Genesis 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. When we read through the rest of the Bible, and we look at this language of rest, what it refers to is... Um, enthronement. After Joshua conquers the land, the land is given rest. The people are enthroned, having made military conquest over the world. Okay, I just paused the recording, so I might not remember exactly where I was, but I, I was talking about the concept of rest, because God is said to rest on the Sabbath day. Uh, the concept of rest refers to enthronement, and particularly it refers to enthronement after a period of war. Uh, we see in Isaiah 52 that the Lord returns to become king on Zion, that's what Isaiah 52 says, in and through the work of the suffering servant, and Isaiah 52 7 refers to this as good news or gospel. Now in the book of Samuel, this phrase good news or gospel is used several times, uh, and it refers to military conquest. For example, when the Philistines come and they kill Saul, they kill the king, then they proclaim good news throughout their cities because the old king is dead, long live the new king. And so after conquest, people rest, the land is given rest from war because after conquest they are given dominion. And so what this is, is this is a paradigm for what man is supposed to do. Man was told to conquer the world, to subdue the world. Joshua 18 makes allusion to this. It says the whole land lay subdued before Israel, which is a corporate Adam. Man was supposed to conquer and subdue the world. And immediately after that commandment is given, we are shown God resting from his work in the creation. Man is the image of God is supposed to imitate what God had done in Genesis 1. The creation was created good, but not complete, not mature, not perfected. Man is the means through which God perfects his creation as the image of God, which is why it is the incarnation of the word, which is so essential. 
That is how God recreates the world, through a man, through the last Adam, and the church in Christ, in the last Adam, as the new human family. One interesting thing that comes out of this is we find across the ancient world, not just in the Near East, but across the ancient world, uh, there are uh, stories of the world having been created through a, uh, a great war. You see that in the Enuma Elish, the gods have this great war and the world is created through that war. And Genesis 1 doesn't show us a literal war, doesn't show us bloodshed, but actually the language of sabbatical rest here shows that there is a deep connection between these ancient stories and uh, the tradition that had been handed on by Noah in Genesis chapter 1. Because God's creative work in the world is, in a sense, a peaceful conquest. It's the way conquest would have worked unless apart from the fall. It's a peaceful conquest of the world, and it's through his creative activity in the world that God attains dominion over it. I mean, this is what we see in the book of Exodus, for example. What grants God the right to rule, so to speak? It is because God defeated Pharaoh in battle. He put plagues on the gods of the Egyptians and so demonstrated himself superior, so he was now enthroned over Israel. And it's this concept of enthronement which shows us the liturgical meaning of rest. Uh, in the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat is not just a chair for God, it is a throne for God. The tabernacle is God's moving palace. The temple is God's actual palace, and the word for temple is the same word as palace. So God has a palace, Solomon has a palace. There's a duality uh, between them. And actually, because there's a duality between them, the beginning of the royal period of Israel's history actually comes in its fullness when Solomon's palace complex is completed. And that happens exactly 500 years after the exodus from Egypt. So a cool little tidbit that you get from uh, biblical chronology. Uh, and so because God rests in enthronement after he has created the world, this refers to God's glory coming and dwelling in the temple. You see this in the Psalms as well. The ark of the Lord is to arise and go to its resting place in the tabernacle of David on Zion. And by the way, that's the only sanctuary ever to be built on Zion. So when the prophets talk about God returning to Zion, it is referring specifically to the Davidic kingdom where the Ark of the Covenant was naked for everyone to see on Zion. It was a special period in history where the Ark of the Covenant was closer than it ever had been before, and it foreshadowed the coming of Christ. Um, so, little tidbit there. So, this refers to God's glory coming and dwelling in the creation, and this is one of the thing, one of the ways by which we know that Genesis 1 is about the construction of a temple. Um, that's something John Walton has pointed out, though I think Walton is totally, totally, totally wrong on the idea that this is just a functional creation rather than a material creation of the world. So God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, sanctified it, that's liturgical temple terminology, because on it God had rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Um, now, in terms of the, his, the history of Genesis 2-3, to Genesis 2 clearly comes on the sixth day of creation. This is when man and woman are created, and that's what happens on the sixth day. Uh, on the sixth day of creation. And um, on the seventh day, this corresponds to Genesis 3. Because it is on the seventh day that God comes and inspects the world. That's what you see in Israel's liturgical calendar. Every day, there's the perpetual offering, and that's when God's fire burns. But on the Sabbath, that fire burns twice as brightly because God comes to inspect his people closely. And on that day, Israel is not allowed to kindle their fires because it is a sign that all of their fire must come from God's fire. They cannot have life in themselves. They can only gather it from God. And that is why, by the way, the man was executed for gathering sticks because the commandment uh, about the Sabbath was specifically, as James Jordan has demonstrated, uh, was specifically about kindling a fire, because kindling a fire was to rise up and attack the kingship of God. And the question that was before Moses was, is intent to kindle a fire the same thing as actually kindling the fire? And the verdict was, yes, it's about the intent of the heart, which is why he was executed. 
So the Sabbath is when God comes and specially inspects his people. We also find in the scriptures that the Sabbath is when the bread of the presence, the 12 loaves of face bread, are set on the table of showbread in the holy place. That's when a tribute is offered to God. Tribute is the offering of bread and wine in Leviticus 2 and in Numbers when the wine is added when they come into the promised land. And the 12 loaves of showbread or face bread, bread of the presence, is clearly a sign of the 12 tribes of Israel being set before God. And you have the, um, uh, the lampstand. It is made out of, uh, it's called a watcher. An almond tree is a watcher tree. The words are the same. And the watcher tree, always looking over the 12 loaves of face bread, shows that God is always inspecting Israel. So when we read these things all together and we find that on the Sabbath, God's fire burns twice as brightly, you have bread being brought before God, and you have God inspecting his people, this sets the context for Genesis chapter 3. Because in Genesis chapter 3, the glory of God comes into the garden. Uh, just like God's glory, fire burns twice as brightly on the Sabbath. And on the Sabbath... Bread was supposed to be set before God. So also in Genesis 3, God was coming in glory. Remember, this is what it refers to to rest. God becomes enthroned over the creation. His glory comes to dwell in the tabernacle. God came in glory in order to have a feast with man at the tree of life. But by the time he arrives, he finds that man has already rebelled against him. And so he inspects man. And after inspecting man, he pronounces curses on the creation, on the serpent, and curses through man as well. The fact that God is issuing curses has to do with God being enthroned. It's the king who makes judgment, and this is what the Sabbath is all about. God is enthroned as king. Having created the world and thus having conquered it, in a sense, God now issues judgments, and the judgments he issues are upon man. And this helps illuminate why we are not told that there was an evening and morning and the Sabbath was finished. Now clearly there was. Historically speaking, the Sabbath day was a specific day. We know that from Exodus 20, which says man is supposed to work six days and rest on the seventh because of what God did. So that shows that the original Sabbath day had an end. But theologically and symbolically, the reason we're not, the end is not spoken of is because the whole story of the Bible is of man entering into God's Sabbath. And in, at the end of Revelation, the Sabbath is eternal. The glory of God lights up the city forever and ever. The whole goal for which the creation was made has been reached. The eschatological Sabbath comes. Satan and his allies have been conquered and cast eternally into death. And so on and so forth. So that is the theology of Genesis 1. Um, a few comments as to its historicity. Obviously, this has a lot to do with uh, debates about science. Um, but I want to make... I won't get into the science at this point. I've written pretty extensively about it on my blog and how I came to change my position from theistic evolution to young age creation. Um, but I'll talk here a bit about the biblical evidence about Genesis 1. Uh, before I mention that, I want to say that Genesis 1 is not the linchpin upon which the case against an ancient earth rests from the scriptures. Genesis chapter 1 records the creation week, but you still have Genesis 2 to 11 to deal with, even if you're able to explain away Genesis 1. And the reason that's so fatal to the ancient earth position is because Genesis 6 and 9 clearly describes a global flood. Attempts to interpret it away as a local flood are just a joke, a complete joke. There was never one such attempt made before uh, the rise of Lyellian geology. Never, not one. Everybody read it as a global flood, period. And the reason that's so fatal to the old age position from a biblical standpoint is because a global flood would undoubtedly have left a geological mark. But the old age position means that you are interpreting the geologic record in conventional terms. But in terms of the conventional story of how these layers got to be, there's simply no room for a global flood because a global flood doesn't appear on top of those layers. The other option is that the record of the flood is in fact a large portion of that record itself, which is where um, flood geology comes from. And it, by the way, flood geology isn't one beast. There are some really bad forms of it, but there are also some, some very interesting and refined forms of it. That's all I'll say about the science aspect. But as for the text of Genesis 1 itself, you know, there are, there are several different ways to try to get around it. Um, perhaps the most classic way is the, uh, um, the gap theory. 
Uh, gap theory used to be a absolute core tenet of Protestant fundamentalism back in the early 20th century when most fundamentalists were um, old agers. Um, uh, the gap theory, nobody really holds it anymore because it's been realized that it was based simply on a superficial reading of the King James text of the Bible. Um, uh, in Genesis 1, uh, 1, 2, it does not say the earth became without form and void, which was the basis for the gap theory. It says the earth was without form and void. And in Genesis, at the end of Genesis 1, the King James has replenished the earth, which is why um, a lot of people read, oh, the earth must have been full before, but it had been destroyed and now it has to be replenished. This is just a mistake because that King James English, but in King James English, that does not mean that it had been full, full before. I don't really need to spend much time addressing the gap theory because nobody believes it anymore, but it's the kind of classic idea. Next most classic idea is the day-age point of view. Uh, the day-age point of view says that the days of Genesis chapter 1 are uh, either symbols of long periods of time or the word yom in Genesis 1 actually refers to age because it can have that connotation. Uh, you know, for all of the stuff that has been written on this, the answer remains fundamentally simple, that you have evenings and mornings in Genesis 1, and you have evenings and mornings being marked by the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day. Um, and the fact that there were evenings and mornings and that they're marked by the sun, moon, and stars indicates very clearly these are normal 24-hour days. Uh, I mean, this is how you interpret a Hebrew word. Even if it has a certain versatility of meaning, you have to interpret it in terms of its context. And in terms of its context here, it's very clear that it's normal 24-hour days. Now, the one objection people are going to, are going to raise to that is uh, that in uh, the, day, the first three days, there was no sun, moon, and stars. But you read the fourth day, the sun, moon, and stars are created to mark the times, but that means that they were created to fit the day and not the day to fit the sun, moon, and stars. God created them to mark pre-existing times. Um, so that's all I'll say about the day-age theory because you don't really find that many people I've found who are into biblical theology and scholarship who hold it. Uh, the next idea, uh, which has become very, very popular in a couple different forms, is the framework hypothesis. The framework hypothesis basically says this. You look at the literary structure of Genesis chapter 1, and you see that the days have a certain correspondence with one another. Days 1 to 3 correspond to days 4 to 6. And when you look at that, you find, well, there's a theological meaning here. Therefore, that means it doesn't have to be historical. My response to this is, this is simply fallacious. You know, the whole Bible has a literary structure. The whole Bible has theological content. The classic example um, is John 20. John 20, uh, Jesus comes out of the tomb. The tomb is in the garden. And on either side of his gravestone, you have an angel overlooking it. In terms of the structure of John's gospel, this is part of the story. In John's gospel, it is structured as a tour of the tabernacle with Jesus as both the Lord and the high priest moving upwards. And as you work through the gospel, you find that thematically, every piece of furniture is commented on in terms of Christ in order. So by the time you get to the end of the gospel, this is the Holy of Holies. There were two cherubim overlooking God's throne, just like there were two angels overlooking Christ's burial stone. But does that mean it's not historical? Of course not. Mary Magdalene, when she saw Jesus, she thought he was the gardener. Symbolically, this is about Jesus as the last Adam. In a sense, he was the gardener. But does that mean that Mary Magdalene did not historically think that he was the gardener? Of course not. And so what this demonstrates is that theological meaning does not entail um, non-historicity. In fact, I think that that concept is very dangerous because when you look at the biblical idea of symbolism and typology, the Bible is symbolic because the world really is symbolic. God didn't look at a foreign world and then impose symbols on top of it. The world was created for the very purpose of symbol, symbolism in the first place. Biblical history is typological because real history is typological. Because God really does ordain all things to the council of his will. He really is the sovereign Lord of history. And to say then that theological symbolism or typology undermines a historical reading of the text is to undermine that fundamental connection in scripture between the reality of world and the reality of symbolism.
couple other arguments for the framework hypothesis. These are kind of biblical criticism light uh, arguments. Uh, one argument is that, well, on the third day we see the plants created, but then in Genesis 2 we're told that the plants weren't yet created. I already discussed that in my last video. Gen uh, the third day only refers to specific kinds of plants. Genesis 2 says the grains had not yet sprouted ears and the shrubs had not been created. Well, in the third day, shrubs weren't mentioned. It's only grain plants and fruit trees. Uh, another argument is that, well, it doesn't make sense because on the fourth day you have the sun, moon, and stars, but the world had already existed for three days, so how could light have existed? Response to that, relatively simple. Genesis 1, the light that is shown is the glory of God. And the end corresponds to the beginning. At the end of the world, uh, the glory of God is going to fill the whole creation and give it light and warmth. Just like at the beginning, the Spirit came down and the glory of God shone on it. Um, so, those are basically the arguments for the framework hypothesis. And the reason that I call it biblical criticism light is because if you look at the way people work at the documentary hypothesis, the documentary hypothesis works by trying to look at tensions between different portions of the same book. And when they come to these alleged tensions and they say, well, this has to come from different sources. Biblical criticism light works by the same method. It looks at these alleged tensions and then it says, well, these must be intentional to clue us into the fact that Genesis 1 is not actually historical. Uh, as with responding to the documentary hypothesis, we take the same method here. The tensions that are supposed to be there aren't actually there. And probably the most devastating response to the framework hypothesis is that in the scripture we do have sevenfold literary frameworks. Exodus 25 to 31, as we've discussed, the tabernacle was commanded in seven speeches, matching the seven days of creation. That is a literary framework of seven but it does not say that the tabernacle was physically constructed in seven days because it wasn't. So what that shows is that Moses and God who inspires Moses, perfectly capable of writing a literary framework without saying it was created in these historical days. So there's no reason to dismiss the historical creation week because there is a literary framework for all of the reasons I've just enumerated. And I know I'm kind of going fast, it's just because this really isn't the main point of the video, it's more of an appendix. Um, the final and most popular thesis today, is, I, I found it's kind of a fad among evangelicals and others, is John Walton's idea that um, the creation week refers to functional creation rather than merely, or rather than material creation. Um, the analogy he uses is the creation of a business or a corporation. He says the buildings in which the business functions have already been created but the business itself is only created once those legal documents are signed and when it actually begins to operate as a business. So creation can refer to function rather than material. And he suggests that Genesis 1 is about God ordaining the functions of the world as a temple. Even though its material had existed before then, it wasn't functioning as a temple. Now, the response to this uh, is twofold. First, it is very difficult to read a lot of the text that is used in Genesis 1 in terms of functional creation. When it refers to the actual separation of dry land and sea, or the separation of the waters above from the waters below, this does not at all sound like it's merely functional creation. God is actually moving things around and organizing them. In terms of the theology of Genesis 1, man is created in the divine image to do things that God did, but man, as a creative agent, does restructure material in the world. It is not merely functionally naming. Man actually restructures things, and he glorifies the creation into a city. The most devastating point to be made against this is that when the creation week pattern is used elsewhere in the Bible, it actually does refer to the structuring of material. The Temple of Solomon was built in seven years, corresponding to the seven days of creation. Those seven years were constituted by actually moving the material around and building it into the physical temple, not merely consecrating it as a temple. Exodus 25 to 31 does not merely record the naming of the uh, instruments at the tabernacle, but the actual shaping and organization of them. So Walton's thesis, when you look at how the Bible actually uses the creation week, um, is seriously undermined. So. That's all I have to say about Genesis 1. I really hope you've enjoyed these videos. Um, 
So I will 